For the three fans who watch this channel diligently, I want to say that I'm sorry. You're probably the only people who know that this episode is late. I wasn't able to record last night because I got busy. And by busy, I mean that I fell asleep. Hey everybody, my name's AJ and this is The Wealthy Idiot Show. Before we get any further, please make sure to smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm, subscribe, comment any questions you have down below. We're trying to give the best personal finance information we can so you can take that information and improve your life, find financial freedom, and avoid the mistakes that people make that lose them a tremendous amount of money. Today, we're gonna be talking about risky real estate. That's real catchy. Risky Real Estate. We should come up with an intro and a new TV series called Risky Real Estate. Spin up that intro. One of my favorite types of investments is real estate. And so on this channel, we've talked about real estate a lot. Mostly we talk about safe real estate, things like house hacking, things like having emergency funds for your real estate, backing up your real estate investments with diverse investments like index funds so that you have absolute emergencies in case you run into any trouble, putting down large down payments, making sure all the numbers work. Mostly, as much as we like real estate and the concept of leverage, we like to do it safely to make sure we're not putting ourselves into a hole that we can't dig ourselves out of. That doesn't prevent a lot of people from going down the risky real estate path. And I think from 2008, when the real estate market crashed until just about this year, if you followed the real risky real estate methods, you would have been pretty successful. And so I think it has encouraged a lot of people to go down that route, but it's also one of the routes that really sunk people right before the 2008 crash because they did some of these things and then couldn't dig themselves out of the hole. So I want to explain what the risky real estate methods are, because as I've explained before, when my best friend Dave Ramsey is talking about risk, he tends to put all loans into the high risk category and any investments you make without loans like real estate are safe and conservative. And my argument is that that spectrum of taking out loans in order to invest in real estate is a pretty wide spectrum. So I want to explain what's on the other side of that spectrum, what people do that is extremely risky. And a lot of people, including major investment firms, are currently doing even when the market is the way that it is. And this is causing a lot of instability and risk. So you can't get started in talking about real risky real estate without talking about the Burr method. Buy rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. Woo. All right. That's a lot. Burr is the acronym. Burr in itself isn't necessarily risky. In fact, it's what we teach people to do here. So I'm not trying to claim that the Burr method is risky real estate investing. It simply means you're buying real estate, you rehabilitate the property. It could be instantly or over a period of time. You rent it out to somebody and then you refinance the property down the line once it's gained equity. And then you repeat this process and continue to grow your real estate portfolio. We're doing it here. I'm doing it in a very slow method. Like I'm buying properties. I rehabilitate them. I rent them out. I watch the equity grow and I'm going to refinance once the um, uh, interest rates have kind of declined a little bit or the numbers actually work for me in the future. So I'm not doing this thing quickly. I'm taking the slow approach and doing it slowly over time and making sure that I'm doing it correctly and conservatively. You can also do the Burr approach very quickly. So you can buy a property, you can re rehabilitate it, put some renters in there. And then almost immediately, I think sometimes there's a limit on refinance timeframes like six months, but depending on what loan you got initially, you may be able to refinance quicker. And then you take the money that you just got out and you start another project. Like you go find another property to go purchase. And there's nothing risky about that as long as the numbers work out correctly for you to be able to do that. Moving to the second point of this video, one of the things that this Burr methods open itself up for is the ability to take out a loan and finance that introductory down payment instead of doing it yourself. So if we look at the numbers and let's say we could actually do this and it is successful, we don't have to put down our own money. What we could do instead is take out a high interest loan, something like a HELOC personal loan, SB lock, um, take out these lines of credit, 
in order, or in some cases, I've even seen people use credit cards for this kind of thing. And they take the cash, they go put a down payment on a property, they rehabilitate the property. And then when they go to refinance, they can take out more than what they put into the property initially. So they have zero of their own money in the property. And then they can pay off that loan and they have a property that's appreciating, supposedly cash flowing, assuming you do the numbers properly, and you have none of your own money actually in the property. That's an infinite return. Let's take a look at an example so that you could see what it is that I'm talking about. So let's say you purchased a home that needs some love at $100,000 and you put $25,000 down. Most investment loans want you to put down 25%. So that makes sense. This house appreciates to $150,000 once we're done rehabilitating it. So we put in the work, new kitchen, new paint. Now it's worth 150 and we can safely assume the appraiser is going to say it's worth $150,000. That means that our equity in the home is actually $75,000. When you do a refinance, they typically want you to keep 30% in the property. So at $150,000, 30% is $45,000. And that means that we can take out $30,000. So we also have to remember that refinance costs points, which means that it costs money to actually refinance. So we want to make sure that what we can take out is higher than what we put in to compensate for that. So this is the perfect case. We took out thir we put in 25,000, we took out $30,000. Now, we could use our own money to buy this property initially, and we just get our money back once the property is refinanced, and then we could do something with that cash. But because this method works so well, and if it actually is working, like meaning we can you know, affirmatively confirm that we can get that uh, appreciation back, we can use other people's money to buy the property. We don't even have to use our own. So we go take out some loan from somewhere, buy the property. When we refinance it, we're getting the cash back. We pay the loan off. And now we have a property that we didn't pay for at all, any of our own cash. And we could repeat this process over and over and over again, and essentially grow a real estate empire, putting no money down. But if you've been watching the market recently, the real estate market, you can already see the flaw in this strategy. The flaw is, can we really get this property to be $150,000? Now, some people I believe are really good at this and they definitely can. There are people who have the ability to um, rehab places on their own. They have a good understanding of what the values are even after rehabs and they can run these numbers. And even in the current market, I think that they can actually do this and it will actually work. For most of us, including myself, I don't feel comfortable, even with the experience that I have, knowing that the numbers work out for me to be able to do this. So this is an extremely risky way of doing real estate. And the people who do it and are successful, they seem to be really loud about it. So they argue to people, this is the only way to go. You'll get rich doing this. Don't listen to other people. But it is risky. And just because you're good at it doesn't mean that everybody's going to be good at it. It's like telling someone like someone who makes half a million dollars a year in sales saying everyone should do this. Sales is easy. Sales is great. And then you find out that a lot of people struggle talking and selling things and it's not really for everybody. So because you're great at it doesn't necessarily mean it works for everyone. So what happens if you can't come up with that difference? Well, you still have a loan that you have to pay for. It could be, and it's a really high interest loan. It could be a, you know, a loan against your house, like a HELOC and your own personal property. So now you have to figure out how to pay that off. Hopefully you have the income to afford that. But if you don't, you're in big trouble. If the market continues to slide down and let's say rents slide down, you could have negative cash flow, meaning that out of your own pocket in order to keep this property. Plus, if you sell it, you're going to lose equity on the property and you still have this loan on the side that you have to figure out how to pay off. That's the risk. It's very risky. And this is what I think Dave Ramsey got himself in trouble with. He was using no money. And when the market switched, he was just left underwater. He couldn't do anything. So he had to uh, file for bankruptcy because he couldn't pay the loans back because the homes no longer had the equity that he needed to get out of that trouble. The next risky bit is a arm loan, adjustable rate mortgage or you can get adjustable rate loans. They don't necessarily have to be mortgages and people are doing this on a mass scale. And if you know that the market is going up, this does make sense. The problem is 
like with the previous example, do you know that the market is going up? So what does an adjustable rate loan do? So adjustable rate loan usually provides, and they, they usually have numbers attached to them. So it'll say like ARM 5.6. And what that means is that you have an introductory rate that is usually lower than a fixed rate loan. And that introductory late rate will last for the years of that first number. So in this case, five years, you're gonna have that introductory rate. Now, every six months after that five years, they can adjust that rate depending on what the market currently looks like. So if you're watching interest rates right now, you're going to see that ARM loans, if you purchase them before the uh, interest rate started going up, let's say December of 2021, and you had a great introductory rate and you're watching rates go up now, if you were to refinance, you could only refinance to a fixed loan at a high rate and you're going to be and you're watching those rates go up you're hoping that by the time this introductory rate is over those rates are coming back down that's a pretty risky move what a lot of people like to do with these arm loans is take them out so that they have a good introductory rate then that provides a buffer between the rents and that introductory rate that makes the mortgage lower and if they take out a loan in order to try and cover the down payment when they're doing that previous step that we were talking about a second ago, if the numbers don't work with a fixed rate loan, they can make them work for now in hopes that the rental market will go up in the future, the appreciation on the property will go up in the future, and then before that five years is up, maybe the numbers will work then and they can refinance to a fixed rate loan and then move on to the next property. So this is kind of a cheat way to get past the numbers not working in a fixed rate loan. You can get a good low introductory rate and make the numbers work for the moment in hopes that the future will solve that problem. And again, if you're watching this right now, like if you were watching this in 2012, you know, this would make sense. You'd be like, yeah, sign me up for all the low rate loans I could get. I'm going to get as many properties as I can get. And if you were doing that in 2012, you're a multi-millionaire, tens of millionaire, they call it deca-millionaire today, you're probably doing outstanding. But if you're starting today and you're watching this video and you could already see where that problem exists in this method, and it's that the rate is gonna go up high because the Fed is increasing the interest rates and you can't refinance to something low. Let's say you were to do this at the peak, like back in March, and you were to get an arm and your goal was to try and refinance. You're gonna be hoping, because you lost equity in this property already, you're gonna be hoping that this whole rate thing turns around before the adjustable rate mortgage flips. And if it doesn't, you're in big trouble, very risky. So I know Dave Ramsey would probably be mad that I'm talking about this today. I'm only talking about it and giving the information as to what people are doing in terms of risky real estate, because right now is the perfect example to show why it's not always a great idea to do that. Risky real estate is interesting. The entire concept of being able to not use your own money is pretty outstanding. Let's check out the calculator real quick. I'm going to show you exactly why it's interesting. So if you were to make, like, let's say you were to put down um, $50,000 on a home and you're making $5,000 a year. So the equation for this is if you were to take what you gain um, per year in return. So let's say it's $5,000 in returns. And let's say we put down $50,000 of our own money. So we take 5,000 and divide it by 50,000. And what we get is 0.1, which is 10%. We get 10% return on our money by putting in 50,000 and getting back 5,000 every year. Let's say we get back a thousand a year. So let's say we take out extra loans and it reduced the amount of money that we get back every year on this property. However, we put in none of our own money and we were to divide that by zero. <laughs> the calculator can't calculate it, not a number. Essentially what's happening is this is an infinite return and calculators can't do infinite. If you put down zero dollars and you're getting back a thousand dollars, that return on investment is infinite. So just to give you an example, let's put in $1,000 and let's just divide it by a really small number, like 0 0.001. Our return on investment would be, what does that end up being? Like 10, like 1 billion percent or something like that, <laughs> right? Because you have to move the decimal point two places for a percentage. So it's like 1 billion percent return if we were to put in like less than a penny. So I use this example to show why people really like the idea of not using their own money, being able to create infinite returns, building all of this wealth over time without having to risk any of your own, uh, without having to put up any of your own dollars is pretty amazing. The returns are outstanding and you can get rich by 
having nothing, starting out with nothing. The dilemma is you really are putting yourself at risk. If you can't figure out how to get the money to pay any of these loans off at any point, your only option out is essentially filing for bankruptcy. So I hope you learned something today. If I missed something or you have other risky real estate ideas, please comment down below. I'm super interested in knowing all of them. Um, since we teach a very conservative method, even though we teach debt, we teach a very conservative method. I'm always interested to know what's going on just generally in the community. The real estate community is so interesting with all this stuff. So please let us know. And if you have any questions about anything that we covered today, comment down below, check out wealthedius.com and I'll see you guys next time.